to begin talking about the business cycle, I think we need to understand aggregate demand and everything that kind of goes into it. And so we're going to spend a, a little bit of time understanding this a little bit uh, in a little better detail. And it might be a couple videos here. So aggregate demand itself is the quantity of goods and services demanded by consumers, firms, government, and foreign entities at various price levels. And so the aggregate demand relationship that we'll typically be looking at that we think about for short-term fluctuations in the economy, it's a relationship that looks like this. So on the x-axis, we typically have y, right? We typically have real output. On the y-axis over here, what we're really going to be comparing this is at various price levels. And so this is the price level. And you could compare this, right? The price level, we could use CPI or we could use uh, we could use the GDP deflator. It doesn't particularly matter either way. I guess the main key that we're looking at is, is we're looking at aggregate demand we're and aggregate supply when we move on to that as well. We're really looking at the relationship between kind of the nominal price level and real output within the economy. The aggregate demand, just like a kind of as as you probably think about demand, it is a downward sloping curve. And so we're going to put, well, let me undo that. We're going to call this aggregate demand here. What I want to do is think through why is this a downward sloping curve? And I think the main thing that we want to kind of highlight or make sure that we kind of break in this is that when we're talking about aggregate demand, this isn't just the sum, right? This isn't kind of the, the sum of all market activity. Um, as we've thought about just normal demand in economic terms, what we're really thinking about is kind of the quantity of goods and services, this relationship as there would be changes in the total level of prices, right? As, there's, as there would be changes in inflation or deflation, in the economy and how that would impact kind of real output, total real output, uh, Y here on the on the X axis. So as we're thinking about, it, obviously we're saying that kind of the, the implicit notion here is that as price levels decrease, right, if there are lower levels of price, uh, if the price level is lower, then there would be higher levels of real output that, that individuals, that firms, that the government, uh, that foreign individuals and firms, they would uh, they would choose to purchase, right? They would consume more, they would invest more, they would purchase more goods and services in the economy at a lower price level. And at a higher price level, they would do much less of that. And so real output would be affected in those ways. What we want to think through here is kind of, let's understand why this slopes down because there's a few things that are going into it. So the first one that I want to focus in on, first one we're going to talk about is price level and wealth price level and wealth. And this is really what we're just at price level here, right? If we're just going to understand what's actually going on with the price level itself. And so this kind of sets in for consumers, for the government, and it's going to kind of follow through with what uh, kind of the rest of what we're going to be talking about here as well. So let's just assume kind of in the most simplistic case, let's assume that you have $1,000. And let's say that a computer laptop, right, laptop is currently being sold for $500. And let's say that this laptop is, whole, is this is like the stand-in for the entire economy price level, the average price level in the economy. So what is your, your dollar, right, is actually worth, what is it worth? Well, it's worth two laptops. Now let's say that the price level increases, right? So you still have this $1,000. You have the same amount of money. Your wealth, I'm sorry, your, your income doesn't change or, or your amount of money in your checking account doesn't change. But let's say that the price level does change and that laptop goes from $500 to $1,000. In this very simplistic example, in this case, then your dollar, right, your $1,000 is now only worth one laptop. And so it's another way of kind of understanding what this relationship is here. As the price level, so what is this, right? This price level, this would be uh, the price level here where the laptop is worth fifty, is worth $500 and you have $1,000, right? You, you in essence have two dollars, or I'm sorry, you have two laptops worth of money, right? And so you would be able to consume two laptops. This is further down, your real output, right? Kind of real output would be higher. And when we think about if the price level, uh, if the price level increases, right? If the price level goes up, what's happening? Well, your real output is no longer equal to two laptops. It's cut in half to one, 
one laptop. And so what are we saying kind of in this simplistic example that our Y, that our output would be decreasing, our potential output would be decreasing. And so at low, love, at low price levels, you are wealthier and can buy more than at high price levels. And let's just kind of, let's actually just write that out so we've got it here, right? At low price levels, you are wealthier. And what do we mean by wealthier, right? You're wealthier, can buy more, you can you can buy more than at high price levels. And I think that this one, right, kind of the relationship between price level and wealth is relatively, uh, I think we kind of understand that pretty well. We've talked about it in a few different ways. What, I, what we do, I wanted to set that up here because it helps us understand kind of this next part as well, right? So the second reason that the aggregate demand curve slopes down, that real output would increase at lower price levels. So what I wanna think about now is at lower price levels, your money is worth more. We just proved that out here. So at low price levels, you are wealthier. And we've understood, we've kind of thought about this, so what does this mean? Well, so one thing that this would mean is that, so therefore, right, you don't need, you need less money to buy the same goods, right? You need less money to buy the same goods. And if this is the case, then therefore, right, I'm kind of using this as, as the stand-in for therefore, you need less money to buy the same goods, so therefore, you are likely to put more money in the bank, right? This is, we've kind of talked about this as well, so therefore, you are likely to save more. You are likely to increase your savings. And what do we know that banks will do? Well, when we increase our savings, banks are going to take some of those funds, they're going to hold some of them in reserves, but then they're going to loan out more of that, right? So what do we know? We, we've kind of talked about this. We've got the market for loanable funds here. I'll just, I'll just draw it in miniature. So this would be loanable funds. And then what do we know on the, on the y-axis is the interest rate here that we've thought about. And we know that we've got some sort of demand for loanable funds and we've got a supply for loanable funds, and what we're saying is that uh, if 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 you, if there's a lower price level, then you are in fact wealthier, and therefore you would need less of your money to buy those same goods, and that has the same effect of putting more money into savings. And what is this? Right, kind of the supply is savings, demand is those who are looking to invest or looking to borrow, and so that's going to push us out to a further right. It's going to shift the supply curve in the market for loanable funds to the right. And what is that going to do? Well, here we can see that this moves us to now this new equilibrium point. And so our interest rate is going to fall on the economy. We also know that as a result, we are going to increase the amount of loanable funds that we have. So let's kind of list all this out here. So therefore, right, if you if we're going to increase our savings, that's going to increase the, it's going to shift out the supply curve. As a result, we're going to see a decrease in the real interest rate. We are also therefore going to see an increase, right, in the loanable funds, loanable funds. What are individuals and companies going to do with those loanable funds? Will you take out a loan so that you will buy a house? Or f firms take out a loan so that they can enter a new market or so that they can build a new uh, building or so they can expand the building that they have? In essence, right, this is therefore, we're going to see an increase in right? Investment spending. And what do we know? What do we know is a component of why? Well, it's investment spending here. And so therefore, we should see an increase in why. And so at low price levels, it should work out to be an increase in real output. And the exact opposite would be true as well. You can kind of think through this in the reverse. And so at high price levels, if we were to have high price levels, we would see a decrease in Y here as well. And so at high price levels, we would see a decrease in Y. At low price levels, we would see a much larger increase in Y. So yet another reason that the aggregate demand curve would be 
uh, would be kind of a downward sloping curve which leads us right this kind of this directly leads us into the third point that we have here and I'll just put it over here as well so we've got the third point this was really interest rates and I'll kind of I'll mark that here the interest rates so the first reason is in wealth the second reason is due to interest rates the third reason that we're going to consider here that the aggregate demand curve is sloped downward is because of exchange rates right I'm gonna mark that as E well we'll just write it out exchange rate the exchange rate effect and so what do we know here well we know that the market for loanable funds is connected to if you kind of remember right well actually we can just kinda of draw this out here real quick so let me just let me take that market for loanable funds I'm just gonna abbreviate it there we've got the real interest rate we had this demand curve in right investment that would be made we had this supply curve and then we had this supply curve that shifted to the right from everything that we were just discussing right over here in this second point so this shift resulted in a decrease in the real interest rate and an increase in the amount of loanable funds on the market what do we then know well this is going to also affect because we know in an open economy we've got net capital outflow and that is also measured right as we're going to re we're going to relate that to the real interest rate and we know that there's some sort of relationship for net capital outflow here and as a result of the interest rate falling because of low price levels we move from this point right to this point in essence we have an increase in net capital outflow another way of saying this is that we have an increase if you remember what is net capital outflow it's the purchase of foreign assets by domestic residents minus the purchase of domestic assets by foreign residents another way of thinking about this is that you can own right if, if the as a result of low price levels you get a lower return on the on the amount that you are that on the amount that you are loaning out and so you might then be interested in loaning out funds you might be interested in chasing higher returns and you might do that on foreign markets and so kind of one of the components of this that we could think of is that we have an increase in the purchase of foreign assets by domestic residents increase in kind of foreign asset purchase and I put it in these terms as well because this is often what you'll hear on uh, kind of in business papers and um, kind of on TV and that type of thing as well and how do we know that that affects the economy well if I just bring this down we know that kind of the third thing that this affects is the market for we've got the quantity of dollars that would be in the market for uh, in the market for foreign currency exchange and we know that we would have some sort of demand right for the uh, for the for for dollars in the uh, market for foreign currency exchange that's a result of net exports because we know that net exports are equal to net capital outflow as we've discussed and what does this bring us well we also know that the net capital outflow provides us with the supply and so this is the original supply that we have from our original point here over here and right down here supply one and then that now brings us down here to the as a result of the lower price level resulting in a lower uh, real interest rate right that flows through to a increase in foreign asset purchase by domestic residents we're going to see net capital outflow increase in the economy which is going to shift our supply over here to the right we see this shift and as a result what's our y access here well that's the real exchange rate as well and so we end up moving from this point from this point right here down to this point right here which is a decrease in the real exchange rate as well and so if we let's kind of list this out the same way that we did before so in essence we're going to see a decrease in the real interest rate that decrease in the real interest rate is then going to lead to a decrease in the real exchange rate right this is also we've discussed this this is also known as the dollar depreciating depreciating and what does that mean when the dollar depreciates well it means that imports become relatively expensive right what does this mean this means that we can only we, you can purchase less foreign goods with your dollar I'm sorry you can purchase less foreign currency with your dollar that is therefore going to make imports right imports 
relatively expensive and exports relatively inexpensive. It's going to increase exports and the exports in the economy. And then what does that mean? Well, we know that Y, right? We know that real output is C plus I plus G plus net exports, which is exports minus imports. And if exports are increasing, this would then increase real output. And so we would also see as uh, kind of as we think about it, as the exchange, as price levels decrease, right? As as we have decreases in the price level, that's going to flow all the way through from everything that we've previously discussed to increases in real output. And so, at a high, if we just reverse that at high price levels, we would see uh, imports that would be uh, kind of highlighted. And so, imports are going to outweigh exports. That would be a decrease in real output and at low levels of prices we see a decrease in the real interest rate which flows through to a decrease in the real exchange rate which depreciates the dollar and results in exports over imports right it highlights exports in our economy and therefore we would see a growth in real output so yet again I just want to kind of understand these three different ways from previous things that we've discussed to understand why aggregate demand would be downward sloping I think that if you understand those three things it makes all the shifts and everything that is to come down the road much easier to explain and to understand.